Welcome to episode six of Elise's Point podcast. I'm your host, Elise Squirrel, PhD candidate, Canadian mental performance consultant, and sport karate athlete. Each week, I present a monologue of different topics that focus on point sparring aspects of sport karate. I want to stress that although each episode stands alone, this podcast should really be listened to as a whole. This project is meant to be informative, thought-provoking, and cause reflection. Keep in mind that some of the content is based on my observations and experiences from years of training and competing as a competitive athlete in sport karate. This means that it doesn't necessarily pertain or is applicable to every stakeholder within the sport. The overall goal is to promote a safe, healthy, and rational sport structure for future sport karate athletes. So let's start. Episode 6 The Young and the Restless Youth Spars We like to romanticize about youth becoming legends in sport, but what happens after? I want to understand this obsession society has about succeeding at a young age. It seems like a weird concept for an adolescent athlete to emerge from the ashes and progress at an extreme rate that reaches past the knowledge that we have about the sport. Let's look at Nadia Komunich again. In one of the previous episodes, episode one, I used Nadia Komunich as an example of an athlete who appeared on the Olympic stage as a 14-year-old athlete achieving multiple perfect tens in several divisions and besting more experienced athletes in gymnastics. We can look at Kamenich as one of the only examples of an athlete completely changing the way humans engage with sport. Although the spectacle of Kamenich demonstrated hope and resilience and brilliance and talent, it also ignored the dark underbelly of sport and society. Here is some more context. Nadia Comaneci was a Romanian athlete under the regime of a dictatorship and the Soviet Union sports system. A different reality from North American culture. Within this system, there is a broad base of children's participation in sport and those who demonstrated signs of athletic talent were identified early and recruited for intensive and specialized training in a specific sport. Kamenich was chosen when she was in kindergarten, and her life from that point on would be directed solely towards the success in her sport. Maybe this sounds inspirational, hand-picked out of hundreds of kids. But there was no choice in the matter, regardless of the parent's or the child's opinion of it. In this case, and in many cases, the athlete is treated as a commodity rather than a human being. Fast forward to 1976. In Komenich's performance at the Olympics, is a moment that is viewed as a pinnacle moment in sport. Art, as I referred to it, being incomparable to any future performances. This one point in sport drove science, because what Kamenich accomplished had never been done, and it was viewed as inspirational. Keep in mind that there were a lot of Cold War politics that were being exchanged through sport on this international playing field. When Kamenich dominated, how do you think that was perceived in North America? It was perceived as they were progressing faster than us. Whatever the reason was, it opened a gateway for child athletes to emerge in North America 
which encouraged early specialization in a sport and focused on working young athletes to their limits to foster their talent. It drove the creation of an entirely new sports system. But there was a choice to enrolling and paying for children in sport at a young age. Through the propaganda of the media, you could promote the ideal of being the greatest athlete ever at a young age. But there is very little evidence that suggests that specializing in a sport at a young age is beneficial to youth athletes. Research demonstrates the opposite, that early child specialization can lead to a range of problems that are detrimental to the child's emotional, social, physical, and psychological well-being, all that lead to excessive injury, burnout, and dropout of sport. Specializing in a sport, in extreme instances, can parallel child labor. For instance, Adult professional athletes are treated as commodities who are drafted and traded, that is, bought and sold. There are many problems within this as well, but it becomes a choice for the adult to treat the sport as a job and have encompassing aspects of his or her life focused towards that. Having the same expectations on adolescence is a little disturbing as they are under the control of a guardian and in very few instances are able to make their own choices. Specializing in a sport as a youth can create work-like conditions in the expectation of future income or benefit, such as scholarships, more playing time, sponsorships, and exposure, especially when there are many adults not just the parents, with future interests in the young athlete obtaining the highest level of achievement possible for more economic and career advancements. This increase of specialization in youth athletes may be due to the fear that not focusing on sport at an early age will lead to failure to fully developing the athlete's talent, possibly missing opportunities at the highest level of competition. And I get it. But it is also unfair physically and psychologically to ask youth to peak in their sport before they have finished growing. Let's take another look at Nadia Komenich again. After the 1976 Montreal Olympics, Komenich a 14-year-old, was the most famous athlete in the world. She had reached the peak of gymnastics and completely reinvented the sport. She was now not only battling multiple countries' new way of training and competing in gymnastics to keep up with her, she was also battling her own physical growth. If you watch videos of Komenich at the Olympics in 1976 compared to 1980, she looks like a completely different person, and not just because of the haircut. She was a child in 1976, and in 1980, she was competing as an adult. Yet, she was expected to have the same performance outcome. That is a lot of pressure for a young athlete to be put under and introduces many uncontrollable factors. If you reach the top tier in your sport without your body fully grown, then you will end up battling against your own self, trying to mimic past performances. And this is where sport karate comes in. A lot of adults who are not parents of the athlete have an investment in the success of young athletes because the success of an athlete can also mean more economic and career advancement interests for that stakeholder. For example, 
once your athlete has achieved a world champion title, you can promote that you train world champion athletes. And you know, this is a really tricky topic to talk about because I'm not saying that young athletes shouldn't work hard and I'm not saying that the support system of those athletes shouldn't be proud of what they accomplish. I'm more wondering where is the balance of having young athletes succeed and want to succeed to the best of their ability and exploiting young athletes for economic gain and prestige to sell your brand or sell the spectacle of sport or sell world championships without having the best intentions for the athlete. That is, for their physical and mental states. And I don't think that young athletes understand this. By young athletes, I mean athletes ranging from 8 years old to 25 years old. There is this naive want of being a legend at a very young age. But it's clear that peaking at a young age might be dangerous. Sport karate emphasizes highly talented athletes at a young age, with not a lot of margin of error. A loss can be detrimental to the way the athlete's talent is perceived, to others as well as to oneself. The jump from junior divisions to adult divisions is similar to the same idea as amateur athletes turning professional. Many talented athletes can see early success in their amateur status, but there is a learning curve when transferring to the professional league. You suddenly are competing against seasoned, talented, and experienced athletes. Sometimes athletes succeed in their amateur status and don't have much success in the professional league. And sometimes the athletes that go under the radar during their amateur status see success when they turn pro. It is the same idea. And it's especially concerning when that talented young athlete's athletic identity is ingrained in their own identity. Evidence shows that people who identify strongly with an athletic identity neglect many parts of their life which impedes on a well-rounded self-concept. Athlete identity is tricky business. It reflects the cognitive, affective, behavioral, and social elements of being recognized with or strongly to the athletic role one plays. It is argued that having a strong athletic identity is not necessarily bad, but if the athlete feels that the athletic identity is the key to the other dimensions of self, that the athletic dimension might dominate the self-concept dysfunctionally. If you're assessing your self-worth based on your athletic outcome, that is athletic identity gone wrong. Continuous success, especially on a large stage, is a lot of pressure to have as a young athlete. I'm wondering why these young athletes need to be put in the spotlight at all. Our sport has gotten into a habit of boosting its young athletes' egos and building them up way too fast. At an early age, it should still be about developing while being competitive, in my opinion. That being said, there is the difference between wanting to have young athletes excel and work hard to the highest degree and having the athlete work to the point that their identity, that is, who they are and what they can do with their movement, is dysfunctionally attached to their sport. If I can't do this, who am I? The idea that identity is so ingrained to the sport that the athlete's self-worth is interlinked with his or her performance. For example, if your body can't work the way it did when you were younger, then how does that change your worth to yourself? The aging body, another entirely separate topic. I know what you are thinking. 
but there is living proof that succeeding and specializing at a young age works. Example of this include athletes like Tiger Woods and Serena Williams. But these athletes are regarded as unicorns, the rare exceptions to the average athlete. Roger Federer, one of the greatest tennis athletes of all time, is a great example of an athlete who did not specialize at a young age and saw his success as an adult. Federer was encouraged to play multiple sports like badminton, basketball, and football, that is, soccer, as he was developing in tennis. More often than not, the sport world sees examples that parallel Komunich's experiences of early specialization and success. That is, excessive injuries, pressure to succeed, anxiety, depression, and self-worth tied to the sport. I understand and respect the concept of training hard in a sport as a young elite athlete and performer. For gymnastics, arguably, you have to start at an early age. Although gymnasts are now proving they can compete competitively as they get older. What is wrong is the exploitation and aggressive promotion of young athletes before they have finished growing or fully developed themselves as an athlete. Athletes should not have to feel that they have peaked as an athlete or as a person when they are young. Performing to the highest ability in sport should reinforce capabilities of what the athlete can do, not define who the athlete is. I would like to end the podcast with a question. How do you know you are taking into consideration the athlete's well-being? Thank you for taking the time and listening to Elise's Point. Check in every Monday so you don't miss any episodes. Does this topic resonate with you? Have any thoughts? Anything that came up while you were listening? I would love to hear about them. Please leave a comment on... Ulysses Point Facebook page. I will talk to you next week. The references to this information are included in the description of this episode. Music by Atch. I would also like to give a shout out to Oliver for letting me share his recording space. Talent sometimes will only take it so far where you need the rest of that hard work to take you there. But hitting a wall is going to happen. Hard work will always beat talent. They just need time to get better. Some of the best fighters in the world have worked at it. You can be smart and go into the ring and just be able to outthink people, but it takes time. <laughs>